So the title of my talk is Deleterious Effect of Neuron Accumulation of Glycogen. So this is a paper which just published and is a collaboration with people that are doing mice. So the paper is in flies and mice, but I'm going only to present the parts on flies, okay? Well, the introduction Fabian already did. And the gene of interest is glycogen synthase. And this gene has only one function up to the moment. It's known to synthesize glycogen. In Drosophila, there is only one gene, while in mammals, there are um, vertebrates, actually, there are two isoforms. One is the liver isoform, and the other one is the muscle isoform, which is expressed in almost all the tissues, including those of the brain. Why I tell you this? Glycogen synthase is tightly regulated, and we observe that muscle glycogen synthase is actually expressed in the brain tissues. It's regulated because when uh, GS is activated, I'm going to call it GS. So GS, when GS is active, it makes glycogen, but it may be uh, allosterically regulated by the surrounding glucose of the media. But most importantly is inactivated by phosphorylation, including, for example, kinases like GSK3 that you might know, which is the equivalent of shaggy in flies. And the last step of uh, control is degradation in the protosome, which is basically done by lafarin and malin. These two proteins, one is malin is an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and lafarin is a, is a very strange protein that has a carbohydrate domain. We do not have neither lafarin nor malin in the drosophila genome. But these two proteins act together to send GS to degradation to the protosome. Moreover, there is PTG, which is called protein targeting to glycogen, and PTG is responsible for the activation of GS. And is also targeting for, targeted for degradation to the protosome by lafarin and malin. But why all this is relevant? Okay, because in some neurodegenerative diseases, glycogen gets accumulated. And all this, let's say, glycogen accumulation is the common denominator to a number of uh, glycogenosis or, or uh, excuse me, neurodegenerative diseases. And, for example, in Anderson's disease that you might see here, what, I'm not going to talk about Anderson's disease, but just to mention, this branching enzyme responsible for making branches in the structure of glycogen when it's downregulated or is missing, the common feature is glycogen accumulation. But what is, what is the topic of today is that when either mal, mutations in either malin or lafarin cause lafarin disease, and basically it, the feature is that it's an early onset neurodegenerative disease which ends up with GS accumulation and glycogen accumulation. The thing is that none of these mutations are involved directly in the synthesis of glycogen. So why we wanted to understand if it's glycogen accumulation is per se the cause of neurodegeneration, or it's just a side effect of many other functions that these malin or lafarin proteins have. So the first evidence comes from in vitro evidence in the lab, that is this paper from Vilches, that what he did is to induce expression of muscle glycogen synthesis in primary neuronal culture. And what, we, what he saw is that the protein is inactive and doesn't produce glycogen. However, if he transforms these cells, uh, this, uh, sorry, primary culture neurons, he transforms them with PTG, which is uh, the activator of glycogen synthase, what he sees is that there is glycogen production that you barely can see here in red. So glycogen synthase is activated and produces glycogen. So the message of this paper was MGS is kept inactive in neuronal culture. So in Drosophila, we have the GAL4, GAL80, UAS system. I don't know if you all heard about it, but very, very roughly is uh, we cross 
female flies bearing a GAL4 activator sequence, and the galate is a repressor. So at 18 degrees, galate represses the GAL4 expression. So there is no transcription of a human gene, for example. However, we transfer to permissive temperature at 29. This galate is thermosensitive, so the galate is degraded, and the GAL4 combined the UAS sequences and they transcribe whatever is downstream of this construct in a tissue-specific manner. So we made use of these systems, and the first question we wanted to understand if in flies is the same as in neuronal cultures. So what we did is we overexpressed the endogenous isoform of Drosophila in a pan-neuronal, in the whole brain, uh, I mean, sorry, in all of the neurons. And we monitor two things. We monitor lifespan, and we monitor glycogen accumulation by this pink staining that it's called past staining, and it, it colors only polysaccharides. This, what you can see here, is the retina, is actually a piece of the retina of the eye of the fly. We chose the retina because they are easy to get uh, slices from retina, not because any other reason, in particular reason. And we saw that even at day 30, which would be here in the curve, we could not observe any glycogen accumulation. But in any case, the lifespan of these flies was normal. Why is lifespan important? Because what I told you before, that Lafara disease is an early onset, as of early onset. So we hope to have flies that um, died early, had a shortening in the lifespan. But this was not the case. So what we could confirm is that in flies, like in culture neurons, the Drosophila GS is kept inactive. So we decided to, so we didn't have a phenotype at this moment, so we could reproduce only the in vitro evidence. So at this moment, we decided to make different constructs of human MGS isoforms, and we did. The human GS isoform has an extra protein domain, which is not present in the Drosophila. So the amount of homology is very low compared to other proteins. So what we did is we cloned uh, upstream uh, UAS uh, in a UAS vector. We did the human MGS wild type, just as it is. And we did two other isoforms, a constitutively active because we mutated all the known phosphorylation, uh, phosphorylation sites that are involved in regulation of this protein. And we did something that is the constitutively active but catalytically dead isoform because introducing so many regulatory mutations might affect in some weird way. So we also made a protein that has, is constitutively active but cannot make glycogen because it bears another point mutation. We run them on a gel to see if all these isoforms could be expressed in the same way, in the same amount, at the same levels in the Drosophila brain. So this is just to check up. And what we saw is that the expression of the, either the wild type or the constitutively active have leads to glycogen accumulation and later on in development to neurodegeneration in these flies. So what you can see here is in the first, in the first uh, column, you can see day three and day 15 flies. So the constitutively active but dead shows no staining. These also are retinas. In the wild type isoform, you can see here almost nothing. There is they are clean, basically. But at day 15, you can start seeing little spots that are amplified here that are past positive. That is, they are glycogen positive. And in the constitutively active isoform, you can see huge amounts of glycogen. So you can see these pink balls, huge balls. But you also can start seeing holes 
in the retina, which are a sign of neurodegeneration. So because past staining is only, it stains for polysaccharides, but it's not specific of glycogen, we went on to look at EM, electron microscopy. So we did also, because it's uh, easy to look at, the photoreceptors, and you can see the constitutively active but catalytically dead mutant. You can see that the photoreceptor is fully functional. However, there is no glycogen. However, in, when you express the wild type isoform, you can see just a little bit of glycogen. And in the constitutively active form, you can see quite a lot. But in later stages, like here, you can see these massive aggregates, which resemble very much uh, those seen in patients. So just to show you this, that is not only accumulated in the retina, but also in other neurons. And you can see it also in the axons. So these are axons. And you can see the accumulation of this very compact type of glycogen. And in fact, all these flies that have an accumulation of glycogen, what you also can see is that they have a short lifespan. So we did two types of assay. One was with uh, galated, that is, we grew the flies at 18 degrees in order so that they do not express any transgene at all. And then we shifted them to permissive temperature so that the transgene started being expressed so the glycogen started being produced. So this is only in adulthood. And then you can see that the catalytically dead has an almost normal lifespan. It's almost because, however, the p-value is, is significant. But if you look at the wild type of the constitutively active, you can see that the red line, they really have a shortening of this lifespan. And we try the same with a different Gulf 4, <coughs> TH Gulf 4, which is exclusively of dopaminergic neurons. And we could see uh, that uh, in this case, the constitutively active but dead isoform was the same as the control, and the other two isoforms had a shortening in the lifespan that could re be reproduced like this one. So this all points to a fact that is the glycogen dose, but not the amount of protein what is involved in the phenotype. Did you try expressing in different tissues? Yes. Um, the point is it's very strong. The constitutively active is way too strong. I could never get flies, basically, in acting in tubulin muscles. I did a, a battery of gulf for staining. But another way to see how flies age is to quantify the climbing defects. And we saw that these flies have strong climbing defects. And even before the flies in the tube start dying. So we could see that flies were like almost dying. But however, the curves, you can see them. For example, here with ELA, which is a paneuronal driver, you can see that at day 10 and at day 20. This is day 10, this is day 20. So here you don't see huge differences in the lifespan curve. However, you start seeing strong differences in the climbing defects. If you use the TH Gulf 4, it's much stronger and you can start seeing differences in day 10, but you also see differences in the curve. And at day 20, differences are huge. So all this points to the fact that it is the dose of glycogen that leads to an early death, and not the protein accumulation. 
This would be the take home message of the train. But just because of many talks we had with <laughs> Fabian, I wanted to show him some genetic interactions. The fly usually is used as a model to see genetic interactions. Well, I'm just going to go through very roughly through a couple of slides to show you that lifespan is not a very good phenotype to do genetic screens or genetic modifiers. However, we found a couple of good modifiers, but these are known modifiers uh, in the biochemical field. So GLIP, GLIP, it's called glycogen phosphorylase. So usually the quantity of glycogen, what is known biochemically, is that glycogen synthesis is done by GS. But glycogen phosphorylates degrades GS. Uh, sorry, glycogen. So it's, you always can see it like a balance between the two enzymes. So we did, Jeanette, here you can see the GAL4, the transgene, and below you can see if they are targeted with GFP, with a glycogen phosphorylase RNAi, or the overexpression of glycogen phosphorylase. What we got is that, for example, in the control here you can see with GFP, in blue you can see the overexpression of glycogen phosphorylase, However, if we inhibit it with an RNAi glycogen phosphorylase in the brain, what we could see is that sometimes we got this increase of lifespan in the control. And this is very difficult to explain, but in a very easy manner, you can say that these can be due to second sight mutations. So lifespan was not a good readout to do a big screen. However, if you look at this one, you can see that the, in the, the constitutively active phenotype was so strong that you cannot get um, you cannot get differences with genetic interaction. In any case, if you look at the wild type, for example, in the case of the RNAi, you do get a decrease in lifespan. So basically what you do is you need a sensitized background to see modifications of the phenotype. So i just show you another quick example, glycogenin. Glycogenin is a um, protein that is required for the priming <coughs> of glycogen synthesis. So you need glycogenin to put together a couple of molecules of glucose so glycogen synthesis can start synthesizing the chain from there. It's kind of a primer, no? And downregulation of this, what it does, it increases, again, it increases the lifespan of the control. It also increases, so it goes in the good direction also in a sensitized background like is the GS wild type, but it has no effect on the constitutively active phenotype. So the next thing was, and this was very interesting for me, the, because autophagy can be targeted for patients. So it was interesting to look what happened to the at the autophagy level to these flies. And what we did is some ubiquitin gels with, uh, so we wanted to understand if autophagy is a cellular response to glycogen accumulation. So we use this technique by which you separate in, it's a protocol by which you separate two phases, one which bears the vesicles, the autophagic vesicles, and you get two gels, with, and you get a triton-soluble phase and an SDS-soluble phase. In the SDS-soluble phase, you can stain with ubiquitin and get these sorts of smears. And this would correspond to the autophagy phase. So we, dis uh, we dissected brains of these flies that bear these genotypes. And we could see that in the triton X soluble okay, you get a whole bunch of ubiquitination. But contrary to what 
I would have expected the one that bears the most autophagy, that is the less ubiquitin in the gel, is the one that is catalytically dead, the one that doesn't produce glycogen. So this was a little bit weird, was completely co opposite to what we expected. We expected that if we increased glycogen, the autophagy, the, excuse me, the autophagy machinery would be upregulated. But this was not the case, so we decided to give it a last chance to genetic interactions. And in the, I don't know if you know the autophagy chain, but you have TOR, which is, let's say, the master gene in autophagy. And all these proteins are in the cascade. So I targeted just to begin just TOR and ATG8, which is the Drosophila homologue of LC3B. Um, yes, I think. And glucosidase is a protein that is already inside the lysosome and degrades glycogen. So what we did is we took our three genotypes, we crossed these flies, and what we could see is that, indeed, in the, at the autophagy level, we got some strong differences, which we did not get in the control flies. However, this difference is, if you look at the mean survival of the flies, and not really strong, but what you see is differences in the, at the young stages of lifespan, but not in the maximum survival. And the constitutively active really differ, <laughs> difficult to analyze, but it seems to be in the same direction as the gel. So basically the, the message of this first part of the talk is that glycogen accumulation per se induces neurodegeneration in a dose-dependent manner. And just to, to end up, I wanted to show you the acknowledgments to both my labs, that of John Guinovat and that of Marco Milan, because all the work I have presented here is in collaboration with people that are doing cell culture, mice, and different uh, cell culture models, so, and biochemistry, so it, it's a collaborative work. And all the facilities that also have given me a hand to finish all this work as soon, as speedily and uh, rapidly as possible. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs>